This episode of The Dog Show features Nate Schomer. Nate is a dog training and canine educational expert and former U.S. Marine. He is certified as a professional and master dog trainer, has over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, and has published his training methodology in the book Nate Schomer's Dog Training Manual. In 2017, Nate's dog training caught the attention of Animal Planet and he was cast as the co-host of Rescue Dog to Super Dog. More recently, he joined forces with the non-profit Operation Therapy Dog, with a two-part mission of helping veterans and training service dogs for the disabled. In the interview, we talk about the science of dog training, and what is the most efficient way to train your dog. Nate, welcome to the dog show today. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, Will. Really looking forward to having a chat to you today, all the way from North Carolina. I'm sitting in my um, own apartment here in Sydney, Australia, so we're on different parts of the world, but uh, you've got a wealth of knowledge in dog training, and it's going to be a lot of fun today to, to chat about that. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely excited, so let's jump right in. Um, before we get into the science of dog training, which is you know what you're so so good at, tell me a bit more about your own dogs. You've got two, I believe, a Malinois and a Labrador. Yeah, I have two dogs, but I live with three dogs. So I have the Malinois, the Fox Red British Lab. People often see him and think he's a Bichler or something because of his color, but he is a Fox Red British Lab. And then we also have a Rough Collie. I have to think about it. Is Smooth Collie or Rough Collie? But it's a Rough Collie. Okay. So yeah, I mean, they're incredible dogs. I mean, dogs are, of course, a really important part of my life. And my dogs, I tell people all the time when I'm working with clients or if I'm teaching something, I say, you know, my dogs are my most important thing to me on this planet. Yeah. So things that I'm recommending for people to do with their own dogs, it's things that I do with my dogs. And of course, as I just said, my dogs are the most important thing to me. I'm going to always try to do what's best for them. And I'm going to try to share that information with everyone else that I work with. So the Labrador's name's Charlie, right? That's correct. That right? Yeah, so is he you or he, he used in your videos? Because I was watching some of your videos earlier and I didn't notice any obvious Labradors being used. He's in some of my videos. Uh, Ari, my Malinois, she's my main star. So mm. when I got her, it was shortly after my first Malinois passed away and I invested a lot of time working with her. And then when I ended up getting Charlie, maybe about a month after that, I ended up getting a host. Uh, I was casted as the host for the show Rescue Dog the Super Dog. And then I really didn't have as much time to train him, but I did do the imprinting. And then I just didn't train him that much after because I was so busy. So he's just not as well trained okay. as Ari is, <laughs> but he's still he's still an excellent dog. So not a perfect fit for the uh, the training videos, I guess, if he's not as well trained as, as Ari. He's, he's good for some of them. In a lot of my videos, I try to use puppies, but then in some of the more advanced videos, I'll use my dog Ari. Okay. Okay. So Malinois are obviously one of the most trainable breeds, would you say? Oh, yeah, they're incredibly trainable. It's one of the dogs that's probably one of the best dogs you can have when it comes to training, but also one of the worst dogs if you don't invest the time to train because they are high energy. They do need a lot of attention, but they're so motivated and they usually have such a high level of perseverance that they'll continue to work even if they don't get the reward right away. You know, the more perseverance and the more motivation a dog has, the easier they are to train. Yeah. Yeah. How, how close are re, closely related to the German Shepherd and the Malinois? They're very close, aren't they? I mean, when people see the Malinois, they'll often ask me if it's a German Shepherd mix, mm. but they do come from different areas. They're just both working dogs. So they are commonly used within the military and police departments and things like that. But the Malinois does seem to be taken over quite a bit because they have less health issues, uh, but they are becoming more popular because of things like John Wick 3, or John Wick 2, was it 2 or 3? One of them highlighted the Malinois breed. And then, of course, the Malinois that was with SEAL Team 6, and then the Malinois that was highlighted in the movie Max. So the more that the public knows, of course, about the Malinois based on either Hollywood or some other event, then the more popular they're going to become. Interesting. Okay. So I mean, what got you into dog training? What was, what was your story? Well, I was in the Marine Corps when I first got out or when I first graduated high school, I joined the Marine Corps. I did that for eight years. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I jumped right into post-production up in LA. So I was sitting behind a computer all day, every day doing, uh, I was a compositor and that just wasn't for me. And I spent a lot of time researching dogs, researching dog training. And I remember one of my friends came up behind me and says, every time you have downtime, you're looking up stuff with dogs. Why don't you do something that involves dogs? 
And one of my other buddies has a dog training facility in Chicago. He invited me out. I spent about three weeks there and it just made sense to me. And I've always been passionate about dogs. I mean, when I was a little kid and I'd go around with my family to visit other members in my family, I would always have to take a giant bag of treats so I can give it to all the different dogs at all the different <laughs> houses that we went to. So it was something I was always very passionate about. And I saw how my buddy kind of lived his life as a dog trainer and it looked very appealing to me. Mm. So he recommended the Tom Rose school or Michael Ellis school for dog trainers. And I looked at both of them. They both seem excellent, but the Tom Rose school accepted the GI bill. So that was the one that I went to and I'm happy I did. I mean, I was there for two years. I was an assistant instructor there. I still have a good relationship with the school. I still do training videos with them. I still talk to Tom. So it's been an excellent experience. And I think it really helped to launch my career especially because, like I said, I had such a good rapport with Tom. Anytime I had a question, anytime I ran into an issue, if I needed help, I mean, he was there to give me the answers that I needed. So it's been really cool, too, as well, to help promote his school and doing videos with him to kind of return the favor. It's been really exciting. But that's pretty much how it happened. And, you know, the rest has been history. You finished top of your class as well, I believe. Yeah, I graduated top of my class in the professional program. There was one other student that beat me. And I mean, he's an excellent trainer. His name's Walter. He has a dog training company called On Point Canine. He's won multiple dog training competitions from PSA to AKC competitive obedience. So, you know, if I was going to lose to somebody, it was okay that I lost to him. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So did you, you never worked with dogs in the Marine Corps at all? No, I didn't. No, I was uh, infantry when I first got in. And then my last four years, I was a drill instructor. Okay, cool. Cool. Well, it sounds like you found your passion at least anyway. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I love it. I mean, I'm I'm never complaining. I'm having such a good time training dogs. I'm working with people and teaching them about dogs. And of course, the um, YouTube channel that helps me promote it as well. So yeah, it's it's a great career path, I think, for anybody who loves dogs. Yeah, I mean, I want people to continue watching the rest of this show, but as soon as it finishes, jump over to your YouTube because it's awesome. There's so many, <laughs> so many good videos. Um, well, I appreciate that. Yeah. But okay, so talk to me about the science of dog training. So you, okay. you talk about it in your book, uh, The Dog Training Manual, which is available on Amazon and on, through your website as well. But talk to me about your kind of rationale behind what the science of dog training is. Yes. So the science of dog training, for me, that's the most important thing when it comes to teaching people. So when somebody reaches out to me and they say, you know, how do you train or what techniques do you use? I let them know that I use the techniques that work. What's important for that specific dog? Of course, you know, often people will say, well, how come one technique doesn't work on every dog? When we're looking at the science of dog training, the science is always the same. So what varies between each dog? Well, things like their intelligence, their motivation, their perseverance, their disposition, all these things are going to change the way that you have to interact with that dog, but the science is the same. So I put together a step-by-step process for people to follow, and I remember one of my main goals to this and one of my reasonings for writing the manual was I really wanted to get it down to where people didn't need me. You know, they would reach out to me, I'd come do one lesson, maybe two, and then then they would be set because what I tell people is dog training is not that hard once you have the correct information. Sure, it's a skill set and you have to practice it in order to get really good, but if you have the information, then you can practice that and then you can reach your goals. So I had a client that reached out to me. They've been training with another dog trainer for about nine months and they weren't getting results and their main issue was the dog pulling on the leash. We did one session, fixed that, And right after that, they were incredibly happy. They didn't have to continue working with an issue that seemed like they couldn't fix it just by doing that one session. So I thought to myself, how can I get it to where people only need me between one to three sessions? And I knew writing the manual and writing a step-by-step process would really help me facilitate that for my clients. So I put together the process. And the first thing that I try to get everyone to understand is that we have roughly give or take, it's not a set number. So some people will say, 1.3 seconds to influence a dog's behavior. It's roughly around one second, some a little more, some a little less. So it really depends on the dog. But when a dog does a behavior we're trying to capture, we have to let them know within that first second if we want them to repeat that behavior or if we do not want them to repeat that behavior. And of course, this is during the initial steps when we're first teaching a dog. So we have one of two things we can present within that first second. So let's say we tell the dog to sit. The moment the dog's butt hits the ground, we have one second from that point to reward the dog. 
So we can either give them the primary reinforcer, which would be food, toy, or affection, or we can give them the condition reinforcer, which predicts the primary. So condition reinforcer, it's been conditioned to be reinforcing. So an example for humans would be money or paycheck because it's been conditioned by society to be reinforcing. If somebody pays you, you can take that money and you can go buy a primary. So what I tell people is that it comes down to predictability and it comes down to pattern recognition. So Ivan Pavlov, the whole dinner bell theory, long story short was he had a tone that would go off prior to the food being delivered to the dogs. After a certain amount of repetitions, when the dogs heard the tone, they would begin to salivate. And that's what he called classical conditioning. What I would always tell people is, if you think about it, he just renamed a word. And the word was predictability because it has to precede. It has to become predictable. So a great analogy to remember this is imagine I put a blindfold on you and I took a stick and I said, I'm going to take the stick and I'm going to swing it at your head. But before I do, I'm going to say duck. So I say duck, then I swing the stick, giving you just enough time to duck. But what if I did this? Duck, you get hit in the head every single time and you're never able to learn. So it's known as overshadowing, scientifically proven. If we present two things to a dog at one time, whatever is more relevant to the dog is what they're going to focus on and they're going to completely ignore the other element. So this goes back to Ivan Pavlov and the classical conditioning. We want to get our dogs conditioned to a sound that predicts a reward. That's going to be our condition reinforcer. So if I use the word yes, for example, and I say yes, and I give the dog a treat. Yes, and I give the dog a treat. After enough of those, when I say yes, the dog becomes excited because they know I'm going to give them a reward. So then when they do a behavior I'm trying to capture, the moment they do that behavior, instead of trying to get them that primary within that first second, all I have to do is let the dog know that it's on its way by saying yes. Another important thing to note, this is where clicker trainers use a clicker. With a clicker, there's two very important reasons why they are so successful. Number one, the click always sounds the same. It's not click one day and clickety click the next day. It's always the same. And it's much easier to separate two physicals than it is to separate a physical and a verbal. So it's easier to go click reward. It's much harder to go yes reward because everybody wants to go yes. That's known as the overshadowing, saying yes while we move. We have to say it, then deliver the reward. Now, once our dogs are conditioned to these sounds, this is where it becomes really interesting. And I really started to try to get people to understand this because even when I was an assistant instructor at the Tom Rose School, there would be students that wouldn't really understand how powerful the markers are. Because I would go up to them and I'd say, okay, after your dog's conditioned to the marker or the condition reinforcer, once you use it, when you say yes, how long do you have to get the primary to your dog before you lose the connection? And everyone would say, oh, roughly one second or 1.3 seconds. And I would say, no, you actually have as long as a dog is paying attention. So people hear this one second, they go, oh my gosh, do I have a goldfish? It's like, no, you don't have a goldfish. Your dog remembers places. Your dog remembers people. They remember where they bury their bone. It's just that when a dog does something, we have to let them know the moment that they're doing it that that's the behavior that we want repeated. So when they do it and we mark it and the dog goes, oh, I did the behavior correctly. Now we have as long as a dog is paying attention, which could be 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever, to get the primary to them. So if you can understand markers, it makes everything else significantly easier. So the first step, I always tell everyone, you have to do the engagement training. This is where we teach a dog to focus on us. And if they focus on us, we're going to pay them. So we're getting focus, engagement, and we're teaching our dog the markers, our communication channels. Once I have a dog understanding that, and this goes with any sort of dog that I'm training, whether it's protection, search and rescue, basic obedience, competition obedience, police dog, the process is always the same. And then the next step is I teach a dog to follow a lure. Now that's just getting a dog to follow food that I have in my hand. Once they get into the position that I want them to be in, I can give them the reward. Or if I have a dog with low perseverance, one that may give up very easily, I might give the dog a reward for, for putting in the effort, but not for completing the behavior because if I make them try to do it all the way in order to get the reward, some dogs give up. Some dogs like, ah, that's too hard, and they give up. So we want to reward them for putting in the effort. But it's a simple concept. It's like the carrot dangling in front of the animal's face. Once they get there, they get the carrot or they get the reward. After I get the dogs understanding that they follow the lure in order to get in every position. So I use the food to get the dog in every position. Heel, sit, down, come, stand, climb, center, spin, roll over, it doesn't matter. 
as long as we can use the food to lure them into that position. So we have to get them to understand that concept. Now, I'll also have people say, well, my dog's not food motivated. And then I say, every dog's food motivated. Every dog is food motivated. If a dog has low food motivation, it's usually because of a few things, either overfeeding, free feeding, giving the dog really high value rewards such as steak and chicken and things like that. Uh, or yeah, that's basically it right there. So if a dog is eating out of a bowl every day and then you try to offer the dog the same food while training, the dog might go, no, I'm not interested in working. I'm going to have it in my bowl later. So what I do with those dogs is I make sure they work for every piece of food. So if I get a dog that doesn't have much food motivation, I bring him on. I go, hey, buddy, you ready to train? And he goes, no, I'm not that interested. I say, no problem. We'll try again at dinner time. Dinner time rolls around. I go, hey, you ready to train? The dog says, no, I'm not interested. I say, no problem. We'll try breakfast. And I don't give him anything in between that. Breakfast rolls around. I say, hey, you ready to train? The dog goes, I'm ready to train. And I say, excellent. We start working. Then once I get the dog to understand that, I move on to the next step. Now, this step is incredibly important. So when it comes to training our dogs, there's four quadrants to operant conditioning. That's our positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment, something people often confuse. And side note, in order for a marker, and the reason why I say this is because people would comment on my videos, they would say, oh, I use the command marker. And it's like, well, command's not a marker. They're different things. In order for a marker or a condition reinforcer or condition correction, a marker to be a marker, it must predict one of the four quadrants of opera conditioning. So if it doesn't predict one of those, it's not a marker. The third step is teaching leash pressure. Now, leash pressure is negative reinforcement. Easy way to remember the four is positive means adding to the equation, negative means taking away. So this confuses people because they think positive is good, negative is bad. Reinforcement means encouraging a behavior to be repeated, and punishment means preventing a behavior from being repeated. So if we know that positive is adding, reinforcement encouraging a repeat, positive reinforcement is adding anything to the equation to get the repeat of a behavior. Food, toy, affection, praise, good boy, good girl, all those are forms of positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement, we turn pressure on. When they comply, we turn it off. Negative reinforcement should not be seen as a punishment. It's another tool to communicate. And the tool that I primarily use for this is leash pressure work. And it really should be called a leash cue because once a dog understands it, it becomes a cue. It's not force. Anytime we're working with our dogs, whatever comes first is what our dog is learning. Whatever comes after that is reinforcing what comes first. Another way of looking at it is if I give my dog a question. So if I tell my dog sit, that's a question in a sense to the dog. When we're first teaching them, we're going, hey, buddy, do you know what to do when I say sit? And the dog goes, I don't know what to do when you say sit. And then we show them. So we start with the question, then we give them the answer. If you think about that, it makes dog training much easier. So when I do leash pressure work, I want the dog to follow the leash. Every dog has what's known as classical opposition reflex. You pull one way, they pull back the other way. So what I do is I start the pressure. Once the dog feels the pressure, that's the question I'm asking the dog. I'm going, hey, when I pull the leash, do you know what to do? And the dog goes, do I, if I pull back, does that work? And I go, no, that doesn't work. And then I show the dog food, which I've already taught the dog. If you follow the food, you'll get the food. So then I put the food in the direction that I want the dog to go. The dog moves forward to get the food. I turn off the pressure on the leash. I give the dog the food. Then I lift up on the leash and I go, hey, buddy, do you know what to do when I lift up on the leash? And he says, no, I don't know what to do. Then I pull out the food, I lure him into the sit by lifting up on the food, nose goes up, butt goes down, I turn off the pressure, I give him the food. And I do the same thing with the down. I lightly pull down on the leash, then I lure the dog into the down position. Each time making sure the pressure comes first because that's the question. When I'm asking the dog, I'm saying, do you know what to do? And once I present the question, right after that, I give them the answer. And I do it over and over and over and over and over again up until I give the dog the question, and the dog gives me the answer before I give them the answer. It's the same as working with, you know, if you're trying to teach a kid about whatever, pick something, if they don't know the answer, you have to give them the answer. And you do it over and over again up until the point where you say, hey, do you know this? And they go, yes, because we taught them. Once I get the dog to understand that concept of following the leash, so now I have these three very, very strong tools to communicate with my dog. I've taught them markers. So sounds that predict rewards. I usually have two of them. So I have one that means you're going to get a reward, and I have one that means you're going to receive a reward, but you're also released. So I teach two of those. It's known as a continuation marker and a terminal marker. Now the dog also knows how to follow a food lure. The dog also knows how to turn off pressure by complying and by following the leash. Now I could jump into giving the dog commands. 
Anytime we want to give a dog a command, it's the same as what I was saying before. It's now it's a question. So we tell the dog down and we say, do you know what to do when I tell you down? And the dog goes, no, I don't know what to do. Then we give them the answer. So it always goes in this order, command, motivate, mark, reward. We give the command, sit, We lure the dog into the sit, or we use the leash pressure to get the dog into the sit. Once they do the behavior, we mark and reward. And we continue to do this up until the point where we give the command and the dog beats us into the position. This also falls in line with service dog training. So when a dog has to do something that, let's say the dog is responding to an involuntary behavior presented by their handler, And we want the dog to respond a certain way. So let's say somebody has anxiety and they become very stressed out in certain environments. And when they become stressed out, they look up and they breathe very heavy. Let's say this as an example. Well, that can actually become a command. If we know that every time this person gets stressed out, they look up and they breathe heavy. Well, that could be the command for the dog. Once we know that, well, now we have to teach the dog the behavior. So let's say we want the dog to nudge the person when they start to demonstrate this behavior. Well, now we have to teach the dog to nudge. Anytime we want to get a dog to do something, this is what I tell everybody. If you want to teach your dog a behavior, if you can figure out a physical cue that can get the dog to do the behavior, then you can turn it into a command. So I did this with a dog and I used a sticky pad. I had a sticky pad and I put food on the sticky pad and I got the dog to touch the sticky pad and I would reward the dog for that behavior. Eventually, anywhere I put the sticky pad, the dog would touch it. So then I put it on my hip. The dog nudged my hip and I rewarded the dog, and I did that over and over again. Then I removed the sticky pad, the dog still did the behavior, and I rewarded it. So the physical cue to get the dog to do the behavior was tapping my leg. That became the cue after enough repetitions. So now I know if I tap my leg, the dog's going to nudge me. So now I have to present the command. In this situation, it's looking up and breathing heavy. So then we look up, we breathe heavy, the dog sees that, and they go, what is that, what's going on? And then we touch our side, the dog nudges us, we mark and reward. So we go through this in order to get the dog to understand anytime I breathe heavy or I'm looking up and I'm showing these signs of anxiety or stress, I want you to tap my leg to get me out of that and get me out of this area. So if we can think about that, here's another example. I taught a dog how to smile on command. Now, it's not how you and I would smile. (laughs) It was more like biting in the air, right? (laughs) Have you ever blown in a dog's face? Yes, it kind of annoys my dog. That's why I do it sometimes, just to play with her. <laughs> so yeah, and I've done that before and the dogs will kind of bite at it, you know, mm. and if that could be the command. So I know every time I blow in my dog's face, my dog's going to bite at it. So I blow in my dog's face, he does the behavior. Yes, I give him a piece of food. Okay, now I know that the dog's going to do the behavior when I do that physical cue. Then I say, okay, now I'm going to put it on a command. So I tell the dog, smile, then I blow in their face, then I mark, then I reward After enough of those, I say smile before I have to blow in the dog's face again. They start to do the behavior. Boom. Now we have a dog that will give us a behavior when we say smile on command. And again, this goes with anything. So when people can understand this, it makes teaching behaviors very, very easy. Then when we use the same thing to communicate multiple different tasks, it makes it even easier. So when we work with dogs, we have two main issues, behavioral issues and obedience issues. Obedience issues is a dog not doing what we ask them to do or a dog not staying in a stay. When I'm first working with a dog and I know they know what I'm asking them to perform so they know the commands, I start by using leash pressure to reinforce everything. So I have a marker or a word that predicts leash pressure. I use the word wrong. When I say wrong, it means I'm going to use the leash and I'm going to put the dog back into the previous position. So let's say I'm working on a stay. The dog breaks the stay. Within the first second of the dog breaking the stay, I say wrong, I grab the leash, I use the leash to cue the dog back into the position, good dog. Let's say I wanna teach a dog boundaries. I don't want the dog walking into the office or into the baby's room or into the kitchen or onto the street. Once the dog crosses the barrier, whether it's the doorway or walks into the street, the moment the dog does that, I say wrong, I grab the leash and I cue the dog back where I want them to be with the leash. The dog jumps up on the couch. If I don't want him on the furniture, wrong, and I cue him off the couch. The dog jumps up on somebody, wrong, and I cue him off. The dog goes ahead of me on a walk, wrong, and I cue him back into position. So I'm using the same word, wrong, ends up meaning stop what you're doing or go back to the previous position. 
and they figure it out incredibly fast. So instead of trying to say stay and holding our hands up as we walk away when we're working on a stay, or if the dog runs into the street, instead of going ah, ah, and making all kinds of random noises, we have a set way of communicating that the dog understands. And then if we're looking at behavioral issues, because this is something that a lot of people run into, when we look at behavioral issues, we have a few things we have to keep in mind. We have fear-based behaviors, behaviors based on aggression, uh, destructive behaviors, dangerous behaviors, or behaviors we just don't want the dog to perform, such as jumping on the couch if you didn't want your dog on the couch. If a dog is doing a behavior that's known as a self-reinforcing behavior or self-rewarding behavior, so the behavior itself is fun, there's two ways to stop that. Either we prevent the dog from doing it, which is most people's preferred method, or we correct the dog for doing it. So then the motivation not to get corrected overrides the motivation to do the behavior. A lot of people don't like correcting their dogs, which is fine. So then you want to do the first option. You want to prevent your dog from doing the behavior. Dogs learn through pattern recognition and they're creatures of habit. So if a dog tries something over and over and over and over again, and every time you prevent them from doing whatever it is, eventually they stop trying because they know it doesn't work. It just takes more repetition. So if a dog is doing something like chewing on the furniture, if you wanted to prevent the dog from doing it, you could use the wrong. So you say wrong and you cue the dog off of biting the furniture or whatever it is that they're doing. You don't allow them to practice it. And again, by developing these communication channels really makes dog training become very, very easy. So again, it's we have the markers so we can communicate within the first second. We teach them how to follow a lure. We teach them how to turn off pressure by complying. Then we put everything on command by making sure we say the command before the physical cue. Then we develop reliability by implementing that leash pressure. And I know it sounds simple, which it pretty much is. <laughs> it's a little complicated at first, but once people start to understand it and they start to put these pieces together, they're blown away at how easy it actually becomes to train a dog. So that's pretty much the science of dog training in a nutshell. <laughs> now, of course, there's different things you have to consider. If you're working with a dog that's very fearful, then you're going to want to implement counter conditioning and desensitization. Or if you're working with a dog that has aggression issues. So there are, of course, a lot of other areas and there are gray areas. But overall, that's the most simplified way that I could explain the science of dog training. I think you touched on it, which is interesting like the human being in the situation is probably the biggest factor as to whether dog training will be successful or not because mm -hmm. as you mentioned like there's these instincts to speak to a dog like you're speaking to a human if they run out into the road or something and, and you've really got to be disciplined in the way you apply the training techniques right yeah absolutely now i'm glad you brought that up too because one of the hardest things for people to do is overshadowing or not overshadowing so that concept of pairing every time i work with people i always find myself almost every single lesson saying you paired it you paired it you paired it meaning they're pairing their physical with their verbal so for any of your listeners that are deciding they want to try this at home with their dog i always recommend first practicing everything without a dog develop that muscle memory and then number two when you do decide to start training with your dog film it Film yourself training and then watch the video. You are going to be your own worst critic. You're going to be like, I paired it. I messed that up. I didn't give the reward correctly. And if you can identify your own mistakes, you can fix them. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. But that is one of the biggest things. And then another one with the leash pressure training, almost every time I'm teaching somebody how to do leash pressure, two most important things when doing leash pressure. Number one, once the pressure is turned on, it cannot be turned off until the dog complies. Number two, the moment the dog complies, it instantly has to be shut off because the dog has to know it's going into the position is what's shutting off that pressure. And if the pressure stays, then the dog isn't able to connect what they have to do to turn off that pressure. And I always find myself again in lessons going, turn the pressure off, turn the pressure off, turn the pressure off, turn the pressure off. Because every second that the pressure is still on confuses the dog. So it's the little details. And once people can get those details down, then they're just blown away by how fast the dog can learn but you're right it's it's a lot it goes down to the skill set of the human and how well they're able to execute all these things and stay disciplined to not go ah, ah or make random noises during training because the dog does something that surprises them well as you said you've only got that one second window to provide the reinforcement um once the behavior's been completed right so that's not Correct. a lot of yeah. time if you're not 
you know, if you're actually training the dog and watching them do everything, then yes, you've probably got, you'll be able to do it within one second. But if you just see the dog doing something in the distance or in your house or something, then you probably missed your window, right? Well, if you see them doing it, even if you're far away, if they're conditioned to the marker, you can use mm. the marker. But if they had stopped doing it and it's been more than a couple seconds, you lost the window. So I'm glad you mentioned that as well. There's a great example that I like to tell people. So let's say, for example, everybody uh, is working a downstay with their dog. So, you know, everyone is listening and they're training in a football field that's fenced in. So they feel pretty confident the dog's not going to run off. They're not worried about the dog taking off and, and not seeing it. So they put the dog in a downstay at one end of the football field and they start walking all the way to the other side and they're not paying attention. They're not watching. They're feeling pretty confident, you know, and they get all the way to the other side of the football field and they turn around and their dog is now running towards them and the dog is approximately 10 yards away. And I always tell people, or I always ask people rather, I go, what do you do? And most people say, well, I say, no, I correct the dog. I take the dog back. Those are incorrect. And the reason why is it takes a dog longer than one second to run 90 yards. Mm -hmm. So by the time you turned around and you see your dog running at you, if you were to correct them in that moment, the dog would think you're correcting them for coming to you and not for breaking the downstay. So in that situation, the best thing to do is either A, turn around and go, yeah, good puppy, and praise them and pet them because you always want coming to you to be a good thing. Or... You turn around and you go, oh, I messed up. And you take the dog back and you put the dog back in a down stay and you do it again, but this time you watch. So the moment the dog breaks, you can go wrong or whatever word you want to use and you can go back and reinforce it. But yeah, little things like the timing. So I worked with a, a dog named Frankie. It was a piece on Inside Edition and they called this dog the demon dog and, and that it was really evil and it was biting its owner. The problem was the owner didn't understand how important timing was. And of course, she was doing everything she thought was correct. And she was really putting her heart into working with this dog. But her timing was off. And because her timing was off, she was accidentally correcting good behaviors. And she was punished. She was correcting good behaviors. And she was rewarding bad behaviors because her timing was off. And the dog was incredibly confused. So once we cleared up the communication, it went from this dog being a supposed demon dog to being like an angel. The dog's like, life is awesome. People understand me. And it just totally changed the dog around, which was really, really cool. So yeah, timing, incredibly important. That's, that's the subtlety between the art and the science that you talk about. Um, like obviously you've got the science, which you can learn by reading your manual, or watching videos or listening to this podcast. But in terms of actually applying that and, you know, becoming a good trainer, it takes a lot longer than just a, a couple of hours. Yeah, it takes some practice. But if somebody's committed, if they want to become a dog trainer or they just want to, you know, have a really well-trained dog. The funny thing is if you're just training your dog, by the time you get really good at training, you don't even have to really do it anymore because by that point, your dog's going to be trained. But of course, you can help family and friends and things like that. But yeah, it's a skill set like anything else. And the number one thing that drives people crazy is that pairing, being able to separate the physical from the verbal. And, you know, the main reason why is however long you've been alive. So I'm 37. So for 37 years, I've been pairing my physical movements with the way that I talk. And because of that, it's it's a habit that I've been practicing. And now after 37 years, I'm trying to separate the two. You know, or somebody else who may even be older than me and now they're starting and they're maybe 45 and they're like, all right, I've been practicing this for 45 years. Now you're telling me to switch it up. So that could be the main reason why it's so difficult, but it's just getting over that hurdle. And once you do, everything becomes so much easier. And I guess knowing how hard it is to break your own habits, you've got to, you've got to give some patience to the dogs that potentially an older dog that you're trying to get to break their habits as well. <laughs> yeah. And the way I'm glad you said that too, because the way that I look at it when it comes to training a dog, people often ask, how long should it take for my dog to be able to accomplish this stuff? Don't put a timeline on it. Mm. If you put a timeline on it, you're going to stress yourself out and you're going to stress the dog out. I just look at it as, okay, I'm teaching this dog a stay, for example. This dog that I'm teaching the stay to, it has a pre-programmed amount of times the dog's going to break the stay. It's already it, The dog's going to do it. So why am I going to get upset? by something the dog's going to do. It's like in order to train this dog, I don't know the number, but let's say it's going to break the stay 1,500 times. Well, I guess I have 1,500 reps to do. And that shouldn't upset you because that's the requirement to train that dog. Mm -hmm. Just like if you decided to paint your entire house, 
You don't paint in one room and get mad that the rest of the house isn't painted. You know you have to do it. So just go through the reps and understand that each dog needs a certain amount of repetitions in order to learn it. And as long as you understand that and you just continue to train until the dog figures it out, it becomes much smoother and you won't be stressed out by whether or not the dog's learning as fast as you had hoped the dog would learn. Yeah, I guess you just got to enjoy the process more than just always looking towards the end outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Because working and training our dogs, it's all about working with our dogs mm. on the same team towards a common goal. It's not about being the dominant and alpha, alpha rolling the dog and doing all these things that are completely outdated and have been proven to be incorrect. It's about saying, hey, I'm on the same team as you are. Let's work together and let's accomplish this goal. And when we look at it that way, training is no longer something that stresses people out or they don't want to do. It becomes this really fun, engaging thing that we get to do with our dogs. And I would hope that anybody who has a dog would spend the time to try and train their dog because the way that it strengthens the relationship is absolutely incredible. It goes from just being something that you hang around and pet with every now and then to being able to communicate with them. And the dog looking at you and going, you understand me. This is awesome. You know, there's been so many dog trainers that I know that are incredible dog trainers. And, you know, even myself training other people's dogs, what happens is if you're doing something like a stay and train, which I'm sure you probably, or some people call it the doggy boot camp or whatever, the dog goes with the trainer, the trainer works with the dog for two, three, four weeks, two months, whatever it is. And when the dog goes back to its owner, the owner is always blown away at how strong the relationship is with the dog and the trainer. And it's because for the past two, three, four weeks, whatever it was, they've been talking to each other the whole time. The dog's like, this guy or this girl, she understands me. We have such a great relationship because she knows what I want or he knows what I want. And we have this great rapport because of the ability to be able to communicate. Um, just before we kind of wrap things up, I just wanted to quickly touch on Operation Therapy Dog and some of the great work you're doing there. Can you just tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. Operation Therapy Dog is still really new. They okay. haven't fully started uh, up and running, still raising funds and getting set up. They have a piece of property now. So it's a, it's mostly in development right now. But the goal is, the overall goal is to be able to train 500 uh, PTSD service dogs annually. Now, that number may seem crazy, like, holy cow, 500. But the thing is, when you're training a PTSD service dog, the training for that is significantly easier than training a CNI dog, for example. People hear service dogs and they think all service dogs are the same. No, some may take two years, three years of training, while you could train a PTSD service dog between nine months to a year and have it pretty well trained to be able to do its job because it simply doesn't have as many requirements as a CNI dog would, that could take multiple years in order to train. And then it's a matter of networking and we're putting together more trainers. And then uh, as well as having volunteers who are going to do a lot of the uh, puppy raising. So the trainers will do the first 16 weeks, that crucial imprinting period. And then it'll go to somebody who's done some courses with us and they understand raising a dog in a family setting or whatever type of setting that the dog's gonna be going to. And then continuing the training beyond that until it gets over to their passed off to the veteran. And then the veterans are going to go through, I believe it's a two month course or something like that. Don't quote me where they have to learn how to handle and continue training and continue working with the dog. And then of course, having support for that. So that's kind of where it is right now. Again, it hasn't officially launched yet because putting everything in place to get to that point is, you know, to say the least, a lot of logistics. Yeah, it's just a great cause because, I mean, there's so many amazing stories of how dogs can really transform people's lives or, you know, help them in their, their process of dealing with issues such as PTSD and other things like that as well. So, you know, you know, I congratulate you for getting involved in that. Oh, I appreciate that. And what I would say to anyone out there who wants a service dog, if you have the time, if you can invest the time and you're willing to, you know, study and learn, so using all kinds of different resources besides the one you've already talked about. But for example, Michael Ellis, uh, I'm a huge fan of him. He has tons of training videos online that are quite exceptional. You have uh, on Learberg Online University, which has a bunch of training videos. You have different clubs that people can look up that support one, one another on how to train. So, and the reason why I say that is because the wait list for a service dog is very, very long. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's, it's something that there's not enough supply for the demand. So people are having to wait three years, four years to get a service dog. But there are resources out there where somebody, if they're willing to put in the time 
and they're willing to take those steps, they can train their own service dog. It can be frustrating, but it is doable. And what I always say is the biggest, most important step is finding the right dog. Don't rush it and just grab the first dog you see at a local shelter. So Rescue Dog for Super Dog on Animal Planet, we were taking dogs from the shelter and we were training them to be service dogs. We spent, I don't remember how long it was, but I think it was roughly two months before we even started the training. Every day for about two months, me, the other trainer, the producer, executive producer, we were going to every single shelter, every single rescue in LA, every single day, over and over and over again to find the right dogs. Because choosing the right dog at the beginning can really determine if you're going to be successful or not. You know, and as, as uh, unfortunate as it is, not every dog can be a service dog. A lot of dogs end up dropping out. You may have heard of it yourself. You know, somebody's like, oh, this was a service dog dropout. The dog just didn't have the right temperament or disposition or trainability to be that service dog. So don't rush the first step when it comes to finding the right dog and then of course, continue to read, study videos, do your research. And if you put in the time and effort, a lot of people can start the process on their own. And like people like you have only got so many hands, right? So you're trying to arm everyone with the information they need so they can do these kind of things. Absolutely. I mean, that was one of my biggest goals besides, you know, trying to help my personal clients, but still trying to help anyone else who has the time to do the research and has the time to work with their dogs. Great. Well, Nate, thanks so much for coming on the show today and sharing all your tips about the science of dog training and all the cool stuff you're doing. Uh, where's the best place for people to go and find out more about you? Well, I want to say thank you. I really appreciate it. I hope I didn't ramble too much because I have ADD, so I go in all, all, all <laughs> kinds of different directions. But you can find everything on nateshomer.com. Pretty much everything is on there. There's links to my YouTube, links to my book, and those are going to be the main platforms. YouTube, I have over 150 instructional dog training videos. So it's a great place to start for people who are wondering where they need to go. Yeah, I highly recommend the YouTube channel. So I'll, be, I'll make sure we share all that information in the show notes. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And I had a great time talking about dogs. I mean, I could do this for hours. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. So could I. All right. Well, I appreciate it. And you have a great day.